so to set the scene for what we're doing at Verum, I wanted to give a background or give an explanation to why we started going down this route. So if you think of how we prove trustworthiness online um, it, or in general in our life, take the example of going to try and open a bank account. So you'll hear the words holder, receiver and issuers quite often during this presentation and hopefully this gives you some context. So imagine you go to a bank and you want to open a bank account. The bank might reply and say, show me your passport, give me a selfie, give me these three or four other documents that allow me to check your identity or check who you are, who you say you are. Um, and what the bank or the receiver of this information then often has to do is they have to go ask the original issuers also proxies of them to say, can I trust what is in these documents? What that usually results in and why it's hard right now is um, you as the holder of that, of that information can't have access to what you need to uh, because it takes in the range of minutes to weeks to check things. Uh, for the bank or the receiver of the information, it takes time, effort and money to check whether this information is correct. And they often have to make payments in the range of, say, 10 to hundreds of dollars as they go to the original issuers or some of the authorized agents and proxies to find out if these things are correct. Which brings me to how the current models of identity are often broken. And that's because the user is not at the core. If you think about how we live our digital lives, um, it, the, the way that our information is stored is often company centric in, in the sense that it is held and controlled by a certain organization or a company. Um, it is typically siloed. And what that means is the average person has about 130 different accounts that they sign up for uh, with various online services. And that sort of like, you know, central honeypot leaves it vulnerable to data breaches. And there have been many, many different records of data breaches that happened just in 2020, last year alone. How this changes in the world of like, you know, what is called Web 3.0 is how can we change this? Uh, and, and we change this by putting the user in control of their own data. Uh, one terminology that you'll hear again and again in the presentation is something called self-sovereign identity. And self-sovereign identity is a way to make the control of information uh, centered around the owner of that particular information. It is user-centric, user-controlled. It is a way of like, you know, having a single source of truth and making data or trusted data portable in a fashion that you as the person or the company that it relates to uh, chooses how it's shared and what is shared. So what we're trying to say is that self-sovereign identity provides a better way. The, the access or the, the process that you're going through, take the example of signing up for a bank account, that can become instant because the check can take place in the matter of seconds rather than minutes or days or weeks or hours that it takes right now. It can be privacy preserving because the technology allows only selectively disclosing what, he, what somebody needs to know. For the receiver of information, it could be almost instant, more efficient and more trustworthy. Um, and it can also reduce the amount of uh, money perhaps they have to spend in going and checking from trusted organizations or the issuers of this information uh, to, to verify that these details are correct. And what that brings us to is how SSI is being adopted globally. And I'll hand over to Fraser there as he's been working on many of these. <laughs> sure. Uh, thanks, Anka. So probably the one that sticks out that I mentioned at the top of the call was, was KTDI, which I worked on with, with Dan uh, between Canada and the Netherlands. But if we take a look across the other side of the world, like there really is a global span and you've got matter building out SSI in New Zealand and also into into the US as well. Um, but then if we take a, a flip side and look at the subject, um, like Turkey and Jordan are both building SSI for refugees. On a complete contrast, you've then got Glyph building ID or SSI for corporations. Um, so there's a complete breadth both across the world and then in terms of subject. And if we step away from this map really quickly, um, there is also the identity of things, so IoT, but also the identity of kind of online uh, identities or virtual beings. So, for example, the ability to port an avatar from one game to another or express a history that you've had on one platform to another. Um, the breadth of this and the adoption is colossal. And that's kind of that wave of adoption is what we're seeing right now. And it's, it's 
try to be illustrated on this map. Um, but if we move on to onto the next slide, this is really the, the bit that we're passionate about. So obviously we collectively know that it's gonna disrupt identity as a paradigm, but the bit that we at Verum are really passionate about is the new business models and new data marketplaces. Um, really what we want to enable is those new business models, which will leverage the new paradigm to put the user at the center, but still generate revenue and also new revenue and new business models for existing, uh, existing companies. If we move on to the next slide, we'll show a little bit of how we're achieving this. So one of the key focuses for us is, uh, like Anka was saying, there are lots of organizations with siloed data, with these kind of honeypots of data that they have. And we need to incentivize them to be part of the SSI paradigm, to be part of that wave of adoption. And what we're looking at here is providing a dedicated network, dedicated token, which can provide that incentive and act as a payment mechanism, payment rail between the receiver of that data through to the issuer, but also including the holder at relevant points as well. And underneath all of this, making sure that any infrastructure provider, including ourselves, is also rewarded. And to give an example of the size of opportunity and why, why we're so incentivized to go after this, um, just one of these markets is, is 14.4 billion a year in terms of revenue. And whilst it's like globally one of the biggest in that it's the US credit bureau market, it is also an industry which is very much focused on uh, selling people's data um, and not doing it in a self-sovereign way. Now, if we move on to the, the next slide, the, the big opportunity for us here is that um, whilst that 14.4 billion is one industry, we're looking at hundreds to thousands of these ecosystems. Um, sorry, Anka, we've lost you. Uh, <laughs> cool. I'll oh, manage to get through. Apologies for that. One sec. I'm not quite sure what happened there. I'm just going to bring back the screen share. Uh, oh, I've got you. Um, so the I can share if you want. Yeah. Cool. Right, there we go. And I'll put this into present. Apologies for the technology. <laughs> yeah, no, no apologies for this. Um, so the key thing for us is there are hundreds of thousands of these ecosystems, all of which require support, and ultimately all of which require kind of that incentive model to truly be successful. Um, and now I'll hand back over to Anka to actually go through kind of the uh, virtuous cycle or the flywheel idea that um, he blogged about recently. So um, what we've seen in the market is there are many large organizations, many companies that are working towards these new paradigms for how data can be made more private, secure, uh, and when, when it's being exchanged online. Just to take a simple example, um, the European Union very recently talked about using this new paradigm of handling private, uh, private and secure data as a mechanism throughout the European Union block going forwards. Um, so we're excited about developments like that. I think more, uh, more organizations issuing SSI credentials leads to more people demanding it and more people uh, accepting it. What we are specifically interested in and what we, where we hope to cause a flywheel effect is we want to reduce the costs of uh, consuming trusted data. So how can we take the current cost of like doing ID checks, which might be around $10 or $50 or $100 and can be quite prohibitive and, and therefore only working in very specific industries where these get used. Um, how can we get, bring that price point down to a much, much lower cost? Um, and the lowering of like, you know, the cost of consuming trusted data will also reduce the cost structure for creating more trusted data out of it. So as an example, um, banks that already go through a process of doing an ID check or a know your customer check um, will be able to consume and issue these credentials at a much lower cost base. Um, what, we, what we hope that this enables is, is a mechanism where um, organizations are incentivized to release digital data back to the uh, holders of that information. And then um, the, when, the, when, when the holders of that information go use it, um, the issues get compensated and therefore creating what we call the virtuous flywheel of SSI adoption. So moving on from why we are doing this to the what and the how, um, 
I think this uh, this segment might be slightly a bit more technical for some people on the audience, but we have a mix of like you know people from different backgrounds. So, for context, the the two biggest names in this are Sovereign and Hyperledger Indie, who paved the way for SSI. Sovereign started as a nonprofit in 2016 and has been has had a live mainnet since 2017. Hyperledger Indie, which is a blockchain framework, it's not the same as Hyperledger Fabric. Often gets confused. Was also released in 2016. Um, and they've really been sort of like you know the 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 pathfinders in this particular space. Um, and we really appreciate all, a lot of the work and the community that has gone in behind it. Um, but we wanted to look beyond Indy, and why did we start looking beyond Indy? So this starts coming down to a couple of things that we wanted to achieve. So when we look when we looked at how do we create an incentivized mechanism, um, we looked at like what has changed since 2016 to now, um, and what's changed is there are a plenty of token-focused protocols to take advantage of. Some of these, which you might have heard of, like Polkadot, Stellar, Cosmos, as well as new infrastructure that has come up, such as uh, Uniswap, which which is a decentralized exchange. What we also wanted to achieve, if we go on to the next one, is to truly decentralize the governance of these networks. Um, as a consequence of like, you know, how Hyperledger Indy is built, um, some of the networks need to remain permissioned, as in uh, the, the people who participate in the blockchain network have to be restricted. And what we wanted to build is much more of a decentralized system where people are able to vote online um, and therefore contribute to the governance on the network. And, and some of the logos that you see here are called decentralized autonomous organizations, and we want to go towards that ideal. Uh, if you go on to the next slide, what we also wanted to achieve is a mechanism of exchange of paying for digital identity exchanges um, also needs to have better support from places that provide people access to this. So for instance, if you think of the likes of Coinbase, Gemini, Kraken, Binance, which are all centralized exchanges that uh, that allow access to blockchain tokens and the ability to hold them uh, in a safe and secure fashion, I think that's quite important for widespread adoption. What we also wanted to look more on the enterprise side is um, how can we best enable our, or look at platforms that are supported by what, what uh, custodianship providers like Anchorage, Metaco, Fireblocks, which are some of the providers in the space that give legal and technical custody for uh, digital assets. So if you move on to building afresh, how did we go about this in the past few months that we've been building this together uh, with some of our partners? We started looking at the health of like the open source community across a variety of different blockchain frameworks. And what we have to say is that like Hyperledger Indie actually has a lot of really, really passionate people behind it. Um, and what you see in front of you is the code commit activity or the, the, the volume and the contributions that have happened to various different blockchain frameworks. And what we see is that Hyperledger Indie has a very, very passionate community behind it, um, but with some activity slowed down beyond 2019. Um, that's one aspect of it. But what we wanted to look at is if you wanted to look at building token mechanisms that are much more extensive, what, what are the other options out there? So just as an example, something you might have heard of is Polkadot, and that has been accelerating 2020 onwards. It's, it's, it has a very great team behind it, but it's still early days. Stellar, one of the other sort of like, you know, frameworks out there had a peak back in 2015, 2016, has had fairly consistent updates since then. Um, but what's been, uh, what's been a standout for us when we started investigating is Cosmos, that is a blockchain that has had a blockchain framework that has consistent and diverse code commit activities since 2019 plus. So this plays into what we looked at next and Richard um, and the product team within Verum um, have been a crucial part of this. So what we did is we tested through experimentation and proof of concepts and, and had a very comprehensive evidence-driven methodology to look at, should we go and implement this on uh, by the way, yeah, <laughs> uh, should we go and implement this on Hyperledger Indy or should we go and look at on implementing this somewhere else? What we wanted to achieve is something that is scalable, flexible, community driven, and also energy efficient in terms of when we when we think of decentralized systems. So one of the things that we wanted to consider in a big fashion, if you move on to the next slide, is 
we wanted to make governance truly democratic in the long term. So for context, Cosmos as a blockchain framework is something that we call proof of stake, where people or node operators put up a financial stake on the network. They uh, often get rewards or fees that are flowing for the transactions that flow through the network in proportion to their stake. Uh, but they can also vote on text and document proposals and software upgrades in proportion of the stake that they have. What's quite interesting here is, is it, it sort of then builds in a built-in mechanism as well for ensuring that people adhere to governance standards, people adhere to keeping the uh, network itself safe and secure and patched up and, and running uh, with, with good availability and so on. And we want to build it like this because ultimately we believe that no single company, including Verum, um, should control critical web infrastructure. If you move on to the next slide, what we also wanted to look at is why not just go build a say on Ethereum or somewhere else? And when we thought about this, what we wanted to do is we wanted to minimize the disruption that might be caused to identity related use cases uh, that happen because of non identity things happening in the world. So as an example, if if ETH prices shoot up because Elon Musk tweets about something or there's something else that's happening in the non-fungible token artwork space that you might have heard about, we wanted to decouple the financial or the economic disruption that might be caused to uh, exchanging digital ID, which is quite often personal and, and company related and time sensitive. We wanted to ensure that the, the costs associated with that don't get um, don't get disrupted by external events. If you move on to the next slide, the last thing we looked at is the diversity of open source projects and libraries. We wanted to look at are we in good company in terms of what else is out there? And some of the names that you might have heard of, uh, which are also using Cosmos, for instance, are Fetch.ai, um, Agoric, Ixo, Binance Chain, Oasis Foundation. Um, and the reason why we wanted to look at this is we wanted to look at a contributing back to the open source community because we are going to release our own code as open source. But we also wanted to look at what are the existing open source libraries and projects that we can rely on that we can perhaps use to accelerate our own product roadmap. And if you go on to the next slide, um, how are we making it easy for app developers to leverage our network? This is an important one because there have been many companies that are already building on Hyperledger Indie and building SSI applications. So what's our strategy there? And so if you go on to the next slide, our goal is to make it our goal is to make it as easy as possible for digital ID app developers who are currently on Hyperledger Indie, which is by far one of the most extensive networks, um, and as well as other SSI frameworks to adopt our solution. To do this, if you go on to the next slide, we want to create um, software development kits that can be easily integrated into existing applications. And, and, and Richard's team has been pretty instrumental in, in building this and, and supporting Verum in this journey as well. Um, the way that we foresee this is, is mobile SDKs or client software development kits that support the existing mechanisms, uh, such as Hyperledger Indie, that um, are used by many of the applications. At the same time, we also want to support this new standards compliance with the decentralized ID standards, uh, Verum Cosmos credentials that will that, that we are going to launch with over the next few months. Quite important for us is to acknowledge the fact that a lot of SSI credentials that are created on Hyperledger Indie will continue existing on Hyperledger Indie for a while. For a while. And so we need to make it as easy for app developers to continue supporting existing deployments that they have, as well as building in new functionality that, that we might be adding. Which takes us to a couple of other things that we want to bring up. Um, to get to the idea of self-sovereign identity that is truly self-sovereign and can easily be used in the real world by most users, it needs to be agnostic of the technology that it's based on. And that's something that we believe quite strongly. Um, and the rationale there is that people or users are not going to download 15, 20 different applications uh, because their application is incompatible with certain standards. They're going to want to carry their digital credentials in, in a fashion that is 
comfortable and convenient for them. And so part of that is we've seen over the past year or so, um, a lot more SSI app developers have become interested in supporting multiple networks. The second big reason is um, annual recurring revenue as a node operator. So this is the ability for um, SSI companies themselves to become node operators on the network and be rewarded through the proof of stake mechanisms and be able to participate in the governance as well of the, of the network. And that's revenue streams beyond just software licensing. Which brings me to Fraser on how we went through the process of switching over to this. Thanks, Anka. So um, obviously, Anka's mentioned more of the technical considerations of, of how we landed in the Cosmos ecosystem. And I think it's it's probably worth, like, we largely took the decision of if time wasn't an issue, which, which ecosystem should we be in? Which is the right place to be based on kind of all the information available to us at, at the time? And then we took a look at what does this mean from a delivery or an execution perspective based on our goal of getting to market as quickly as possible? Does this hinder us or does it help us? And roughly it kind of breaks down into, into three areas. And roughly what this looks like is that initially we have kind of token issuance of the network being live. Then we have kind of a progressive build out of the identity functionality. So we kind of did like VCs or the kind of stuff, BBS for signatures. And then longer term, we're looking into building more functionality into both the token and the governance side of things, while still maintaining parity on, on the kind of identity side of things. And broadly, um, whilst uh, it kind of touches on Anchor's point around there being existing infrastructure and existing uh, projects out there implementing both DIDs and tokens on, on Cosmos, and ultimately, um, inside that first window where we are launching to launch a token, we are looking to um, bring a public network live extremely quickly. Um, there is a massive benefit to being inside an ecosystem where that tooling and that project, those projects exist. The logic here is that whilst we could have built a token out onto Indy, and that's obviously the direction Sovereign originally went down, the reality is there are no exchanges, no custodians who support our platform as for tokens. And we would have had to effectively go to what are extremely busy companies and lobby for them to go and build onto a new technology. As it currently stands, it's much easier to port over the decentralized ID capabilities than it is to move the token side of things around. So at least in the initial, initial phase, um, we're de-risking ourselves from that perspective. And then we look into the identity side of things where things temporarily will be more complex. But the nice thing is the longer the timeline, the more certain we are that we should be in, in the Cosmos ecosystem. And the reason behind that is, and we'll move on to it in the next slide, is that um, all of the uh, items that we have in our roadmap are all made easier by being inside, inside the Cosmos ecosystem. So traditionally, for those of you who've gone through kind of technical due diligence on, on calls or due diligence before, when looking at platforms, you tend to start off with rose kind of uh, rose tinted spectacles, looking at a new technology or a new platform, and it looks incredible. Um, and the more you dig into it, the more problems you find, the more items you find that weren't like you were expecting, the more things where the documentation deviates from what you were hoping. And the beautiful thing that we found with Cosmos actually is that it's been a positive experience. So we were transparently nervous because changing platform or at least certainly moving away from the community and then also having to kind of make sure that we were going to market as quickly as possible. And in fact, what we found is everything in the native Cosmos implementation, as well as the community, is actually making our lives a lot easier. So as we look to go further down the line into verify pays issuer, into more complex pricing models, into kind of governance or uh, decentralized autonomous uh, organization implementations, there is both native functionality there, but also projects, open source projects looking to do the same thing. So there's a massive benefit in going down that path as opposed to trying to bulldoze our way through the Indy um, implementations. And that kind of brings us onto the timelines on the left-hand side. So I guess to finally close out, the focus immediately is going to be bringing a test network live inside the next month or so. And then the focus after that is very much focusing on bringing a persistent multi-steward production network live um, with the token live and with did capabilities kind of rolling onto that as well um, before we start tackling that longer term uh, roadmap where we are going to need all of the capabilities that Cosmos brings us. 
so without further ado, I think we're over to questions, unless uh, you want to add anything at the end, or, or Richard, if you would like to give any, any words. I think that's a, a really good explanation of what we're doing. Uh, I was monitoring the comments. Uh, one thing to point out is uh, we found that Tendermint's implementation model is close enough to Indies that we're able to reuse a lot of our existing technology. Uh, we did evaluate a variety of systems and the ability to forklift, uh, to mildly adapt, to move a lot of existing technology instead of starting from scratch was really important. Yeah, and, and thanks, thanks, Richard. Um, one thing that we understand and we're quite clear about, like in our long term strategy is we recognize and realize that the the, the future of self-sovereign identity um, is not necessarily tied to one specific platform. I think realistically, um, many, many different networks are going to need mechanisms of having this kind of value exchange for digital ID. Um, and long term, that is something that we would love to do at Verum. Uh, but we want to execute on something first, prove the concept, um, and then accommodate for more, um, more sort of like you know, multi-channel and and agnostic ways of doing it. So, I think I think while there are good arguments on any side, and I think this this often gets a bit religious on on which blockchain framework should be used or better and so on. Um, I think anybody can come up with justifications for for their own uh, sort of like you know spaces um wanted to be we wanted to pick something that we are relatively comfortable with um fix that execute on it build something ship it and then ensure that we can build similar capabilities across other frameworks and other mechanisms of doing self-sovereign id um some of which 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 don't even use blockchains for decentralized id um so yeah that's that's our thinking Cool. Um, so on that note, I think there's quite a few questions that have come in. Um, Fraser, do you want to take them from top? Yeah, I think that's probably the easiest. So yeah. um, I think there was a mention of Constellation. Um, I think transparently, having moved over from Enterprise World, it's not one I've heard of or not many clients using. Um, so I think that was one that um, probably looks to yourself and Richard, if you've heard of it, but it was one that even in my enterprise career didn't crop up that much. Um, and I think one of the main reasons for Cosmos was that um, it has that vibrant ecosystem. It has so much token infrastructure and it has widespread support. So from a public permission standpoint and getting the token live, it really ticks all of those boxes. And I think potentially with Constellation, whilst it has a, adoption must do with some enterprises because it's being referenced, um, it again would fail the same problem with having all of the uh, kind of I guess, wider implementations of tokens, but also some of the support like centralized exchanges, custodian chip providers, all that kind of jazz. Yeah. I think Johnny has then gone ahead and also mentioned Hedera and Definity. Um, I think we welcome all of those different projects. I think there's going to be many, many different projects that exist in this space. Um, I think one sort of clear differentiator from projects like Definity and uh, Solid perhaps is we aren't just looking at making these data containers that have some information. What we are trying to do is we are trying to have trusted information. And I think there's there's space in the market both for distributed file storage as well as uh, trusted data or verifiable credential exchange. So I think if we if we go further down from from constellation, um, I think the, the next one was probably, uh, there's been a load of back and forth on, on that front. Um, there was one around the relationship with, with Evanim. And uh, Rich, I don't know if you want to take that. Otherwise, I'm happy to. Uh, Evanim's a, a key investor in Verum. Uh, and we're really excited. We've long recognized that having an incentivized network for SSI is important, uh, especially to be able to preserve privacy and credential exchange, be able to enable new business models around verifiable credentials that don't have third parties ver seeing everything that happens in the ecosystem. And so we're thrilled that Verum has these same goals that we've been worried about and we're doing everything we can to make sure Verum's successful. Yeah, and I guess um, probably, I don't know if I missed it in your reply, Richard, but I guess the, 
um, whilst you are investors, you are still kind of agnostic to, to ledger technology as a whole. Um, so obviously there's kind of an investment here, but you're still obviously involved in, in Sovereign and, and kind of other networks as they begin emerging as well. Yeah, yeah we plan to support Verum in addition to other networks, but Verum's vision for an incentivized SSI network is, is something we've long strived for and we're, we're very much behind. And something to sort of like in a note, maybe perhaps like as referenced on the last slide, um, if, I think it's still some questions. Yeah, um, is the bits that we are referencing around the complex roadmap. While it's relatively simple on a lot of different platforms to get the ability to have a token out, um, what we are quite interested in our future roadmap is to enable these to be customized, perhaps based on uh, ecosystems that pop around geography or based around the different industries. Uh, just to give an example, different industries have different pricing mechanisms. They have different economic models. Um, they have different ways in which they look at reputation or liability. Um, and what we want to consider when we are building this is not just a mechanism for exchanging that data, but also looking at um, how much can we accelerate our product roadmap that enables us to make the complex token functionality possible as well. Cool, thanks, Angel. I think that covers off most of the questions so far in terms of, I think they largely revolved around kind of those the Evan points and then yeah. uh, revolving around Constellation and Hedera Definity. Um, very happy to take more questions as well. Oh, sorry, Richard, you were going to say something. Uh, there was a question about uh, Ethereum versus other solutions. Uh, one of the challenges we have is uh, we we want a native token, and certain a lot of the blockchains we evaluated would require us to purchase large amounts of their token in order to overlay our token on top of it. And so we wanted to make sure that we have a native token that can be independent of a third party token. I think that's so. It also relates to the uh, point that we made about we wanted to minimize the disruption of external events on identity events. So, as an example, if one of our one of our sort of like you know big goals is, can we make ID checks more more, more uh, can we make ID checks cheaper? Um, so, if there's if there's a problem where like an ID check on a given day say costs. One dollar, but it on a different day it is a thousand dollars. Not because of something that is happening in the identity use case world or proving utility in the identity world itself, but because of congestion that is caused on the network because of other events. Um, I think that's something that we wanted to avoid. We of course want to have some form of decentralized. Um, equity, so to speak, within the network itself, where the token itself does have a store of value of some sort. Um, but we separately also want to look at how we might be able to make the actual transactions that are done for ID checks uh, somewhat stable. I hope that answers the question. Um, Barry, to answer the question, like, you know, will we be dead set on, on, on Cosmos? I think there's value in sticking to one execution plan and executing it well. Uh, but what we have not written off, like I mentioned before, is we don't see this as just a single blockchain play. I think long term, what we want to look at is to enable this kind of mechanism on, on multiple blockchains and multiple technologies. And that, I think, is going to be a much more real world user scenario of how the, how, how these interactions happen. Um, and, and I think it's it's good in terms of like, you know, how self-sovereign identity itself plays out. Um, okay, so Mark said, if Verum would not create the SSI infrastructure, what would you think uh, would be the next best thing to benefit that of the SSI bandwagon? Start an issue company, start wanting a node. Um, I think probably it's providing that abstraction layer, I, I feel, and yeah. all, all being very focused onto a use case. Um, I think myself and Anka were both involved in the extension of FinTech Innovation Lab when we were still there. And the companies that we saw that were successful were either 
the likes of Evanim, who were very lucky to have as a partner and therefore were building the software and could be kind of broad. Or they were very, very focused onto a single use case using SSI and could really articulate it well. Um, so I think for me, it's either acknowledging that there's going to be some abstraction um, or it's very much focusing into a niche area and making that extremely successful. Um, ones that uh, there are companies that came through the fintech innovation labs, but um, probably the one that I would pick out internationally is uh, Sferity, um, where they have focused very, very clearly onto a few use cases and executed upon them. Um, I think those are the, the kind of two models is either stay broad and agnostic and sell software or go super focused onto, onto a direction. That's that's my initial uh, initial gut feel there. Yeah, um, and and I, I I completely agree with that. I think what we what we want to enable is uh, to be to be to be clear. We want to provide this sort of. We want to really execute well on ensuring that value exchanges and digital ID happen, and that's the payment rails that we're providing. And we want to make it easy for enterprises to consume as well. I know, uh, you know, blockchain or tokens as a word often sometimes scares the large enterprises that issue trusted data or add their reputation to trusted data, uh, which is why we want to explore things like how can we do legal and technical custodianship and provide those services to the large enterprises? How can we perhaps make it a system where they they only have to pay in fiat and the exchange, like the, the blockchain sort of like, you know, is, is just a payment rail in the background. So I think there are other parts of the stack as well that uh, we plan to tackle as well as I think there will be other players in the market who try to tackle that um, and providing those differentiated services at the end of the day, perhaps to end customers is where we see um, SSI app developers right now being able to make money as well. I think uh, quite an interesting one from Macho. Um, so um, in terms of pro platforms that were built using Tenement or Cosmos that your team learned from, so that's probably for yourself and Richard, I think, given that you explored a very, very long list uh, from the documentation I've seen. Richard, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, uh, from a token implementation, uh, the Binance token and of course the Cosmos token native uh, and Cosmos cash were all really useful for us to look at to get a sense of how quickly it'd be to, to bring a token to market. Uh, there is an SSI project called NIM, uh, which is similar in a lot of ways. Uh, their, their architecture is different than what we'd like to target, but it showed that it is practical to, to build what we're trying to build. And the uh, Fetch AI of course is, is a related company uh, we know a lot of the team over there, and they're, uh, it, it was neat to see them uh, see how they've been successful with it. it. It's a good proof of the technology to see what Fetch AI has done with, with Cosmos. Yep. Cool. Uh, are, there, are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, conscious that we had the, the time yeah. as well that we have. So. Uh, so we'll give maybe another minute for just any final, uh, any final messages. Uh, uh. Oh, cool. Thanks, Johnny. Um, always good to know kind of the direction people are taking and sounds like a worthy cause as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess a final call for, uh, for any other questions. Okay. Um, in which case, like, oh. Uh, that's an interesting question, Mirko. I think um, that will be an innovation that it's not just up to Verum to offer. I think that's a service that in itself, a lot of like you know, service providers in this space might, might start offering. Um, so our sort of like initial target is, um, I, I don't think in our initial timelines within September slash Oct uh, October, when we are talking about, we'll be able to offer those exchange rates directly. Um, I think that's something we want to tackle in our long-term roadmap because we recognize the challenges that 
enterprises have, having worked in a lot of enterprises. Um, having said that, I think the innovations around how exchange rates are offered and maybe they're locked in in fiat and then somebody else takes on the risk, um, that's something that we, we ourselves haven't planned to offer for now. But I think um, it gives space for innovation to others in the market to offer that kind of service. We, we haven't considered it. Um, we've got a last question, like from Christian. I have not looked at on ramper, but I will, I will, I will take a look after this. <laughs> yeah, and I guess uh, just I guess to to add something to to Moko's question and your answer, yeah. um, I think that is where we ultimately want to get to. It's like money flows in, it comes out another place, and almost you don't need to worry about what it's passing across in between. Um, and the more that we can make that. Um, kind of lossless, the better. Um, obviously, there's going to be some kind of transaction fee in there just to be able to cover costs, but um, the more that we can make that known and upfront, so that is one of the elements of how we're architect architecting the system is, or the platform is, how can we minimize the volatility and how that impacts the actual day-to-day -day price of, of credentials and for kind of did rights, did schemas, or, sorry, credential deaths and all that kind of stuff. So it's very much a focus. It's like making sure that money flows in one place, flows out another, and it's very, very predictable over the long term to make it make it as usable as possible for, for everyone who needs this. Thanks, everyone, for joining.